Making is very inclusive as a term. Um, and, and I think that that is one way that it actually kind of works. It's actually kind of a brilliant intermediary, interdisciplinary category for a lot of different things. I, I think if we can take one thing out of the whole maker movement, I mean, hacker spaces are, are really phenomenal cooperative workshop kind of concept that is really commendable. I think another thing is, is just the term of maker. It really kind of, for me, summarizes much of the attitude of that I had seen in the past of people working in between disciplines. And it's nice because it's almost like a category for an amateur. Um, it's almost like a category for a non-professional, amateur, interdisciplinary, hands-on, kind of serious, kind of not, kind of in between a number of different things. And in that way, the term maker it is useful. My name is Garnet Hertz, and I'm going to show part of the process about how I made this book. And I'm going to show how you can make your own booklets. I've used Adobe InDesign to lay this book out, and uh, you can use virtually any application, uh, Microsoft Word, Pages, Notepad, or whatever, uh, as a piece of software to lay it out. We go to booklet printing, okay? It actually prints double-sided and it puts everything in order so that it goes like this, okay? After our printer chugs out the printed file, it does this. It can be folded like that. So if you staple this and trim it, you have your booklet. One trick with making booklets is that most standard staplers will have a hard time reaching this far. They're normally maybe this long. So what you need to find or buy is a uh, saddle stapler, it's like this, or a long arm or long reach stapler. So that's folded like that. And what we want to do, stick this in here. Now we don't want to uh, staple it right at the edge because we're going to cut that off. So we come in, hope for the best, give it a couple staples. I found that um, two staples actually works better than three so that we have the staples on the inside. So you put it in. You can see on the other side, I'm lining up where I want to cut and I'm clamping this down. Ready? Ah. All right. Then we have the first cut on the right. 
if you're doing lots of booklets, I tend to put stickers or tape on the uh, on the cutting bed so I know where to line up the stuff. Uh, I'm a little bit afraid that I'm cutting off too much here. It's always best to cut off too little. So you can always cut more, but you can't put it back. There. This cut is pretty cool because you can cut through very thick stuff. So then we have this. So this is what it looks like when it is trimmed and looks fantastic. Now, um, the copy that I did last night here was trimmed with scissors. And this is perfectly fine to do that, or you don't even have to trim it. Um, but you definitely get a different look. You can see that this looks much more almost frilly edge. Uh, and part of the reason there is that it's just really difficult to cut through this many sheets of paper at the same time with a pair of scissors. So, so that's it. Thanks. There are tons of other terms that are fabulous. And in some ways, it doesn't really matter. There's lots of different terms. Interrogative design is something that Christoph Wojcicko at MIT Media Lab. And that's actually one of the first verbalizations of how I see my influence as coming from is interrogative design. Christoph was an artist that was really relatively confrontational, or, well, not relatively, like super confrontational in public space doing projections of images on large structures, doing a large scale architectural level protest work in public space, large spectacles, doing things to highlight political injustices, different social issues and so forth. Um, he had actually published a great two page essay called Interrogative Design that outlines you know, a lot of what we have here in either critical design, critical making, or whatever, however you brand it. I don't think the brand is particularly super important, but I feel that the attitude is.
I think in some ways you can say it's a good idea to have people designing technology. You know, let's include people in making technology. And that, that's good actually for getting grants. But it's kind of like, well, why would my grandma design a cell phone? So it becomes actually pretty interesting. You know, it actually becomes, that's actually interesting. When you actually get the grandma designing the cell phone, that, that's actually when it's like, whoosh, that's when you have really interesting, weird stuff happening. After you, after you get the, any tool working, whether it's a table saw or, or a 3D printer or, um, or a laptop, you know, you boot it up and you get it going. After you understand the basics of it, you hit a crossroads after going over the technical, you know, demo what to make. And, and with making things, you hit a crossroads where where after you've you know built the box or the object or the printed thing, it's like, what's the application of it? And you you end up at a crossroads where it's like, is this thing going to solve a problem? Then uh, how is it kind of design work? You know, or is it is it going to inspire somebody? Does it maybe fall more into the category of artwork? The problem of what to do with the makerspace is in many ways continuing with the program of what's already been established of, of design and with art. For me, I think that informal kind of production is important. And I do think actually that the arts and media arts and those areas have a lot of potential. And in this maker stuff, I really see a lot of potential in bringing those kind of media art type of things to a wider public. It's a really interesting avenue to think about that work, you know, spreading out through hacker spaces and in a different kind of way with new audience oh, and also with new producers and people, you know, feeding off of that work and building their own work. Electronic countercurrents and in art, art and, and design. Wow. Yeah. So I basically lay out a framework of kind of DIY practice and both write an art history of the history of kind of maker stuff that artists have been producing for, for decades. I try to lay out a history of electronic art in the 20th century. And this kind of work has been happening for 100 years, right? You can find people doing hacker-ish type electronic art projects for a century. In terms of the publishing of critical making pack of zines, uh, 10 different booklets, one thing that I was quite interested in, in exploring in that project was alternative forms of academic publishing. The people that I had talked to and tried to get contributions from. Some of them were hackers and makers, but quite a few of them were kind of ivory tower academics. And I know that they're very creative people, like I, because I'm friends with many of them. I was interested in trying to curate a collection of alt academic publishing in some ways. And this is kind of a subtext to that project is I was interested actually in the information scientist 
that draws a maze or an, an essay as a drawing, you know, scholars actually thinking about the publishing format a little bit. And so I had tried to solicit and encourage the mainline academics to think about the format. It's not like this is like gears and steam engines and whatever else you imagine as like making, but for these academics and for some of the people, it was, it was a different mode to publish in. And, and for me, I, I got a lot of satisfaction out of helping academics be artists in some ways, you know, of helping, of helping these academics uh, get out finger paint uh, or get out scissors and glue, right? I think this is, part, this is part of why people were actually interested in it too, from, apart from the topic. I mean, academic publishing works in many ways and is very good and has a lot of strong aspects to it. But there are other ways to think about academic publishing. And with that project, I really wanted to kind of play with that a bit and to take those writers and to, instead of just writing, do a little bit of writing making. For me, it was really interesting, you know, to think about other ways that academic publishing can be experimented with. And, and on that front, I'm, not, I'm totally not done, done experimenting around with alternate modes of publishing. I had worked on a project when I was at University of California, Irvine, called Toy Hacking. It was funded as an informal science education research study into doing workshops with girls. We didn't do large scale kind of studies or anything, but we had seen that there was quite a bit of positive uptake from the female participants in the electronics workshops that they were doing. Their perceptions of whether they felt included in technology was actually impacted more by participating in a hands-on electronics workshop than the guys were. Toy hacking. Our research is targeted at engaging women and minority groups through circuit bending workshops in electronics. Circuit bending is a creative short circuiting and manipulation of electronic devices, such as battery powered children's toys, to create new musical instruments or sound generators. In these workshops, students learn how to disassemble toys, how to work with electronics, and how to customize the devices with switches, knobs, and light sensors. We authored an innovative instructional guidebook to introduce students to circuit bending in English, Spanish, and Chinese, and have held workshops in Los Angeles, Pasadena, Irvine, and Berlin to test and refine our curriculum. We are currently translating our guidebook into more languages, creating a kit for students and teachers, and envision this project being put into a mobile lab, a customized low-rider taco truck that offers workshops throughout communities in Southern California. The combination of a clearly designed guidebook, the leveraging of artistic and musical creativity, and low technical requirements contribute to the strong success of this initiative in science, technology, engineering, and math education. That's about it. Cool. One dynamic that I, I see a lot of in different hacker spaces, there's quite a strong, what I'd almost call an anarchistic sense. You don't really care about degrees, but you do care about skills. And this helps you rise to the top in the kind of hacker scene. What I see is men in these spaces use meritocracy as a microaggression tool to control spaces. It's a destructive kind of dynamic that see real skills as a particular thing. Computer programming, for example, a laser cutter or something like that. Defined around skills that are is not really inclusive skills. And they're used kind of like gatekeeping in some spaces. 
And so in spaces that I see more women being involved, you know, you really do see these different tools in place and different people in place, establishing workshops and tools and different things that are, they're much more actively kind of guarding against tool bros. Uh, maybe I would describe it tool. Yeah. Tool bros, tech bro, but they're, they're like tool guys that they sit and they hang around like a laser cutter or CNC machine. <laughs> Their machine is kind of their friends and it is super strange uh, and gender is not completely irrelevant, you know. You bring up a good point. You know, what counts as making? I mean, and you can substitute any any term, what counts as science, what counts as art, what counts as you see the work that women do and the work that girls do often kind of shuffled outside of those categories. You know, you see that that type of production work fenced off by men. I think that a key thing is to look at what has been left out of the field of expertise, of how we make things, how we create technology. In, in society, we've gone down a path of, of professionalizing things in a certain way that is very productive and that produces a lot of great stuff. We have a lot of fabulous inventions that are created by computer scientists, by designers, by, by companies. And this has a lot of benefit for society. At the same time, it's left out a lot of other people. Some of these are worth listening to and some of them maybe aren't worth listening to. But there's different modes of experiencing the world, different modes of thinking about stuff, different ways of, of experiencing in reality, artistic modes, creative modes, informal modes, third world modes, BIPOC modes, female modes. There's many different modes of creating stuff that, that often does not have a voice in development of your standard iPhone or Android phone that smaller independent people can address. And I think that, that that's really exciting and really interesting. And at the same time, I, I see a lot of excitement and interest there and a lot of opportunity there and how to kind of leverage that to, to do interesting stuff and how to include those people that are normally excluded from making technology and from having a voice in society and to figure out like how, how they can participate and what is their contribution to how we design things. And I think it's really clear that technology has a capacity to be much more interesting than it is right now. And that I, I really do think that diversifying the, the design of technology has a lot of actual social impact. If it's thought about in human terms, in a global way, that's responsible and kind of thinks about the planet and people and treating people with respect. And of creative stuff and what makes humans humans. I think a big part of this also is just like treating people with respect and, and also not just looking at people as a pile of big data. <laughs>